Hey guys, this is Hardy from Digital Painting Studio, and today let's talk about the cool factor in concept art. What the hell is cool? How do you quantify it? How do you create it? When that is your job as an artist, when you have to sit down at a desk and manifest something cool out of thin air, it can be really daunting, especially when it's very difficult to even sit down and say what cool even is. It's one of those things that you can't really describe, but you know it when you see it. Well, today I am going to try to actually describe this Break it down into a bit of a formula that I try to follow, and this applies to most things. So today, let's let's paint a badass robot. I'll take it from design all the way to a finished painting, and we will kind of talk about the things that I do, the formulas that I follow, the priorities that I try to always keep in mind that usually reliably, predictably gets me from a blank canvas to something that I know with, with pretty good certainty is going to be cool. So whether you are making concept art, just doing designs like I'm doing in the beginning of this, or whether you're an illustrator, anyone in the broader cool stuff painting realm, this will apply to you. So as best as I can, let's break down the cool factor and turn it into a series of qualities that we can be really conscious of and that can help you sort of put it all together when you're trying to do this in your own artwork. And if you followed me for a while, I bet you can guess what my first one will be. It is shapes. It's something I've heard over and over again from every artists who I really admire, every huge YouTuber, every industry giant, they all seem to agree on this, that it all starts with shapes. The longer I work in this field, the older I get in this industry, the more I learn that to be totally true. Think of it this way. If something works as a silhouette, it's already cool. You can just have an outline. You can't even really see any interior detail. But shapes are so powerful in the way that our eyes and our minds process things that it's pretty much the foundation. It's the bedrock of how to make things that look cool. So every favorite robot, spaceship, character, you name it, you can look at a silhouette of it and you can instantly recognize it. I'm sure you've seen art talks on the internet where they show you an entire sheet of recognizable designs, but they're all in silhouette. You can name every single one of them. And you can really see how cool and successful they are, even at that most fundamental level. So shapes have enormous power over how we process things, and they just instantly ring that visceral bell. We come up with our impression of something really quickly, and that all has to do with its silhouette, with its shapes. And this is all kinds of factors. We have things like all of these core design fundamentals that guide how to make shapes relate to one another in a pleasing way. There's things I'm sure you've heard of like shape language, you know, circle, square, triangle. Each one of those shapes can evoke certain things and you can choose whether to lean on one of those core elements a little more than others to kind of steer things in a certain direction, but it all comes down to shapes. So when I'm in a design like this, that's where I like to start. To think of it another way, if I don't get the shapes right, no amount of good work on these following steps will really matter because if the shapes suck, it's just never really going to get off the ground. I can render this thing to be absolutely gorgeous. It can be stylized, it can be almost photorealistic, I can put lens flares all over it, but if that core shape design isn't there, it's just not going to work. So, there we go. The core, the thing at the very bottom of the pyramid on making something look cool, capturing that cool factor 
is the shapes that we choose. That's why so much of my time and energy goes into that initial step. And really so much of my training, so much of the stuff that I have learned slowly and painfully actually informs this very first step. It looks like the simplest part, but it's actually way more brain intensive. It takes a lot more thought than even the polish steps, the like high level painting finish that I'll do at the end of this video. This is the really brainy stuff. So there you go, shapes, item one. The next important element in capturing that cool factor is sort of related to the first one, but it is evoking things. With a shape or a color or some kind of a detail, how can we remind our viewer of something else? So for this robot, its general design, it is humanoid, right? It's got arms and legs, kind of a head we can relate to a little bit. So. There you go, we have humanized this a little bit. It evokes the human form. That lets you imagine how it walks, how do its arms work. It can reach out and grab things. It can jump, it can kick maybe. But taking it a step beyond that, basically human, I've made it kind of curvy and leggy. It's got some feminine qualities to it, some really nice liquid S-shaped curves to give it that athleticism, that sort of really human touch that makes it evoke a personality. So already this machine is feeling like something else, something that we can relate to. And you can do this with all kinds of things like animal references. You can make your robot look like a gorilla. You can make it look like some kind of a sea creature. You can evoke real world machines. So I could make this look like some kind of a big bulldozer if it were this futuristic bit of construction equipment. Grounding your designs in real world references is very powerful. It makes your viewer just accept it. When they see something that they recognize, even subconsciously in your work, it lets them kind of buy into it and then they can start picking up on all of the other stuff that we put in in later steps. But this is one of the first bars that we have to clear is getting your audience to accept it. And grounding your designs, evoking real world things is one of the surest ways to do that. Kind of giving it that foundation where your audience will recognize this is something that they can believe in, something that they understand, something that they can relate to. Incredibly powerful. Another way that we can really capture that cool factor is with stories. In a way, all art is visual storytelling. We want our audience to experience something, to kind of know something that we were feeling, something that we were trying to communicate, some way that we were trying to connect with that person in that moment when they find our work. Stories are really powerful, and there are so many ways that we can weave narratives or just imply things into our designs and paintings. So things like design language, just looking at this, you can totally see the genre. This is very sci-fi. Every little curve and line and shape that I chose for each panel and seam and rivet, even the little vent holes where heat escapes from this machine, all of that is meant to cement this robot into a universe. In a way, whenever we design and paint something, we're not just describing that thing, but we're telling our viewer about the entire world that it comes from. Just where we are now, can you sort of imagine like a broader story that this bot fits into? Maybe he flies around in space. He kind of jumps from station to station, getting in laser fights and holding his shield up. Maybe he defends some colony. There's this whole implied thing that your viewer can start to wonder about. 
it draws them in. It makes them participate. It makes them take ownership. And I think that is a huge key in crossing that threshold of the cool factor. Because when you think about it, it's a relationship. There has to be that other person on the other end seeing your work and experiencing it in the way that you want them to. Beyond that, kind of having them take over the story a little bit in their own mind, kind of completing the narrative. And when it becomes that bond, you know, that, that really involved thing where they buy into your work, it makes them love it. When it becomes part of them, when they get to sort of finish the story themselves, it's always what they thought it should be. It just works out. It's a really powerful thing when you can start thinking about your work as a relationship with the viewer. So tell stories, find fun little details like little logo things you can put on a robot to give it some kind of a brand or affiliation. Maybe it's part of some army or maybe it's a corporation like a James Cameron movie. Maybe this is something that works for some spacefaring profit company of some kind. There are so many ways we can go with that. Every little detail that we choose, every chipped bit of paint, every bullet hole, every little bit of wear and tear shows you that this machine has been places. It has seen some stuff. And that just makes the whole world, the whole life of this thing you're creating seem very real and very authentic. And it draws your viewer in. It kind of makes them want to know more. What led this robot up to this point? Where's it going? You know, who are its friends? What is it fighting for? Who is it fighting against? All kinds of cool stuff that can just really wrap your viewer into your world. Finally, and notice I saved this for last because believe it or not, it's actually the lowest in priority, or I guess sort of last in order of priorities. And that's the rendering. How cool is this painting? How beautiful and stylish? How cool were your color choices? What kind of cool effects like atmospheric perspective? What nice little glows and blooms and little specular highlights, things that look both realistic and three-dimensional and believable, but also painterly, you know, down to the brush strokes. What kind of just beautiful artfulness were you able to weave into this thing that you have created? Definitely part of the cool factor. I think as an artist, appreciating other art. This one is one that I really like to nerd out with. I, I like to really get into like the brush strokes in every choice on, on every one of these little stylistic concerns. All of my favorite artists, that's some of the stuff that I admire so much, is artists who can be very realistic and technically right on point with their rendering. Something looks real and three-dimensional and very much like the thing it is meant to represent. But at the same time, it's all just loose, chaotic, expressive brushstrokes. Weaving all of that style and humanness into their artwork. That is something that is definitely Something that gets me really excited about other art that I admire, and it's always something I aspire to in my paintings, and something I tell all of the artists who I work with as, as their teacher, is this is something we need to try to capture, is doing both. Rendering it to look real and believable, but also being stylish, artful, and brushy. A big part of that, again, something I have just had to learn painfully, a big part is letting go is kind of not just rendering things to death for the sake of the more polish, the more hours I put into this, the cooler it will be. I have actually found that is sort of not true. It, it's actually the opposite. I have a old portfolio full of paintings and I can just see me 15 years ago rendering everything to death. 
thinking that maximum effort, maximum hours would equal better art. Not so. Only when I started realizing that all of my favorite artists, all of their work just looked brushy and chaotic and expressive. It looked alive. That's what I realized that I was missing. And it has been a really slow evolution until I've finally gotten comfortable. And actually, it's one of my favorite parts of a painting now is that sort of letting go step where we can just start smudging things around, maybe not caring so much, hiding some of this stuff in the brush strokes. And it gives your painting so much vibrance and life. So all of those things that we need to do to make a painting look real, like good use of value, realistic colors, you know, atmospheric things like fog and blooms, lens effects to make this seem real, very important and definitely something that will make your image look cool. But we can't forget about the human touch as well. Give it some style, breathe some life into it, let go a little bit and sometimes just sort of rake your fingers through your painting at the end and show the hand of the artist. Show that it was you who made this. Very cool. I love how this one came out. This feels cool to me. I hope you like it. And if you want a detailed tutorial on how I did this in every step, every design choice, every brush I use, every technique, I've actually got a project kit. This is the next one that we are releasing this month and I'll link that here. So check that out if you want a long form step-by-step -step tutorial on this. But I hope this was helpful guys. Good luck with your artwork. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, paint something cool today.